Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to our ESG Integration into Investment Process webinar. Uh, my name is Mzuki Sikhalawe. I'm a Senior Institutional Client Fund Manager uh, with Prudential. I'll be your moderator today. Joining me are my two colleagues. Uh, to, my, to my right is my colleague Anthony. Anthony is our in-house ESG specialist. Anthony has been uh, a representative to the UNPRI since 2007, and as such, he's played a leading role uh, in developing a responsible investing uh, policy. He's also played a leading role in developing our inaugural uh, stewardship uh, uh, report. Um, Anthony, welcome. Uh, dialing in uh, remotely is my colleague Adil. Adil is head of uh, research and he's also uh, part of our equity portfolio management team. In that role, he plays a supportive role in managing our in-house, uh, you know, house view equity portfolios. It is also a co-portfolio manager for our flagship uh, Prudential Equity Fund. So in terms of uh, housekeeping, uh, today's event is a CPD event. Uh, so we will be making the CPD certificates available in the next two weeks. Uh, we'll also be making the recording uh, of this webinar available together with the visual aids uh, we're going to use today. And then just lastly, uh, we have received a lot of questions from the audience. I think there's about uh, over 500 people attending the, the webinar today. Uh, what, we, what I've sought to do as your uh, moderator is to distill those, and I'll be directing some of them to my colleagues. But please make use of our live chat, um, our live chat feature. Um, we do have a team of experts on standby that will assist us answer your questions. But we've selected a few questions to answer towards the end of the, the webinar. So the topic today is uh, ESG integration into the investment process. And I think uh, to kick off the presentation, uh, my first question is to you, Ant. Responsible investing is, is quite a broad topic. Uh, and it's one that you know has you know uh, you know an, a, a plethora of uh, uh, alphabet soup, uh, where there's different sort of approaches. Uh, so just to give you a sense, we we talk we hear about uh, social responsible investing, we hear about conscious investing, um, and then obviously ESG is is one of the the, the, the tried sort of uh, strategies that we've seen out there. What I'd like to do, and I know you can talk about this for, for hours, and if I let you, you will. Yes. What I'd like to do is to focus the discussion today on, on ESG and ESG as it relates to integration. Can you just give us the flavor of what the audience can expect uh, from, from this discussion today? Absolutely. So ESG is quite broad, and ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. It's probably the oldest of the schools of thought when it comes to responsible investing. For the sake of simplicity, ESG can be split between your engagement side, that's where you drive companies for change, uh, you try and influence companies, and you try and get information out of companies. The other side of that is integration, and that's what we're looking at today, and that is how an analyst will look at a particular stock and say, how do I look at ESG in terms of getting value out of that entity or monitoring the risk out of that entity? So that's our focus, it's quite narrow. We're going to stick with equity today. We've got Idle with us, he's on the equity team in terms of head of research. So, yes, that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. Adil, welcome. Um, this, the, this question is to you, really. Uh, as you, 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 you wear two hats. Uh, on the one hand, you're head of research. On the other, you're portfolio manager. Um, in your travels, uh, you, you, can you give us a sense of whether ESG integration is something new? Um, and, and, and if not, uh, what's your sense? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Zuki. Uh, thanks for, for hosting and thanks, Ant, for joining. Um, I'd say ESG is, uh, is really a rose by another name. So, you know, if we take a step back uh, and look at the elementary features of investing, um, I think it would be broadly agreed that you have two components. One is risk and the other is return. Um, Aesop's fables, kind of a couple of thousand years old, um, says that a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. And the gap between the bird in hand and the two in the bush is really risk. ESG talks to um, certain, uh, certain kind of softer, softer elements of that risk spectrum, uh, as Ant mentioned, environmental, social and governance. Uh, and, you know, since events like 2008 financial crisis and the threat that, you know, climate change, uh, ch change poses for, um, 
for 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 human uh, human existence and for investing in general, these topics have become uh, far more important and have gained a greater urgency. Um, and in in light of this, uh, we we have looked to build a specialist capability in this area, and that's something that Ant is intimately involved in. Um, but to answer your question, no, Zuki, it's not it's not new. Thank you. And the next question is to you. Um, I'm sure in your daily, uh, you know, dealings, you 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 deal directly with, uh, you know, uh, investors and clients, and you must have daily dealings with uh, investment consultants. My question to you, and I guess uh, some of the questions that are coming from my client is, why this webinar, why this topic, and why now? Thanks, Oki. Okay. I think we get quite a few requests for ESG and integration so it's becoming more topical. Consultants are becoming more interested in it. We're also seeing that as those requests come through, there are quite a few misconceptions that we want to address. And I think we're probably going to do that before we get into the actual integration process. Uh, the first is that it's some kind of mystery black box, that we have some magical process or secret source that we apply to stocks and we get some kind of answer that can discount cash flows. And I think we want to address that quite quickly. The other two issues start at the beginning and the end. There's a misconception that if you screen out stocks that you don't like, you end up with an ESG portfolio. And that's not true ESG integration. It's very good, but it's not ESG integration. The last one is the more cynical view, which is portfolio managers come to the end of their construction and do a greenwash. It's like looking at your fruit for insecticides after you've bought the fruit. Um, so we want to pop that misconception as well, that it can't be a bolt-on process. Okay, and, you know, and my background is in equities trading. When I hear black box, uh, the first thing that pops into my mind is you know, complicated mathematical uh, you know, processes running in the background and algorithms. Can you unpack what you, mean to, uh, what you mean by the term black box? Yes, I think what we mean by this is that it's not a defined formula, it's not a defined fixed process. Ultimately, there's a subjective element to it you can weigh up particular risk factors, but at some point, someone has to decide what the weighting of that risk is. And when, when I was checking to Idle last week, this is something that, that also hit home very hard with him as well. So I'm going to ask him to jump in here on the quantifiability. Idle. Sure. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, you know, ESG is really concerned with the risk factors. Um, and any practitioner would tell you that, you know, um, risk lies on a spectrum. Uh, on, on the one end of the spectrum, probably let's call it the highly quantifiable stuff, you'd have stuff like carbon credits where I can pinpoint a dollar amount um, for, you know, whatever cubic uh, volume of carbon emissions. Uh, further along the spectrum, you'd get stuff like the sustainable profitability of a hydrocarbon uh, energy producer and what the impact will uh, of, of ESG related considerations will be um, over the long term. And then, uh, if, so even though that is quantifiable, it's quite probabilistic uh, in, in how you have to approach it and you come up with some sort of a probability distribution. At the far end of that spectrum, you probably have issues like governance uh, that sits within a bank. So, you know, a bank is either compliant uh, as far as the law is concerned or they're not. So, or it's bankrupt or it's not. Um, there is no halfway point. Um, that would be, you know, you could say that's quantifiable, but really it comes down to, to a judgment call. And that tends to be quite subjective uh, and requires fairly intimate knowledge of the space you're dealing with. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, and it's not a black box, and uh, as uh, Adil alluded to, it's it's uh, there, there are elements of it that are subjective. Um, just to to play devil's advocate, um, why why are we seeing just uh, an increase in ESG providers? Um, is there any value to be derived from from these sort of sub, uh, um, advisors? I mean, Absolutely, providers. We've got some great ESG providers in the country. Um, we we super specialists. We also see a lot of data providers coming out with data that you can slice and dice any way you want. You can get heat maps, you can get risk analysis, you can get any formula that you want. These can be good. So for clients, it can be a way of checking out the risk profile in their portfolio, independent of us. It can be a way for them to engage us. Now keep in mind, many of these providers will get the information from public sources. They may come with a different rating to us. It's an opportunity for clients to come to us and say, we see stock X at a rating of 8, yet you're overweight. 
um, talk to us about it. So it is good, but I think the point we're making here is we don't rely on them to weave into our actual investment process. It's a good risk and monitor check, but the buck's got to stop with the analyst. Many providers have got teams all over the world comparing with stocks from other geographies. Do you want them doing it, or do you want the analyst who lives and breathes that particular stock? We've got a small universe. So our analysts are able to look at just a few stocks at a time and really get intimately involved with them in terms of knowing all the factors, including ESG. So I think that is key. The buck's got to stop with the analyst. Um, it's an example is, is I think, um, we'll tie it a bit later. Um, sorry, let's just move to Idle. I can see he's itching to get in here. And I'm going to start stealing his thunder. Sorry, Idle. Yes, uh, I, maybe maybe to lead on to that uh, to, uh, to that question to my previous question. Um, so what I'm picking up is uh, we're saying that ESG integration has to live within the investment team, and it has to be uh, part of the investment process DNA. Uh, in your role again as as both uh, head of research and portfolio manager, are you seeing this uh, coming through? And if so, uh, just give us a sense of how that looks like. Thanks, gents. Yeah, I was waiting for that word DNA, uh, and I think that's a nice, nice way of describing uh, how ESG fits into the investment decision-making process. Um, so, as as I mentioned, uh, ESG is uh, arguably the softer components, um, or some of the softer components of the the, the risk side of of investing. Uh, in so being, it has to be part of the DNA. Um, so fundamentally. Um, we should assess the risk of an investment alongside the potential return, uh, and ESG would fit quite neatly into in, 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 into that framework. Um, I, I guess the, the the most topical and recent example would be Steinoff. Um, so you know, to Ed's point uh, of kind of greenwashing. Um, Steinoff would have ticked all the boxes. So they had a big four audit firm. I'm sure they had, you know, a very credible audit and risk committee and all the statutory reports. Uh, and they would have gone about um, kind of, you know, doing all the things that a credible um, uh, tick box type setup uh, would have asked you to do. Um, but at the end of the day, they just, you know, they, they, they weren't effectively governed. Uh, and and the government the governance element uh, element um, was was missing, so it was only the analyst uh, who was intimately involved in analysis of that of that company um, that was in the privileged position to say, hey, something is off here. Even though they have uh, you know a big four audit firm, um, something doesn't quite sit right to, with me, uh, and that's very difficult to to quantify and put into a tick box type framework. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, Zuki. And just to pick up on this theme of uh, quant uh, not being quantifiable, in, in terms of the questions that you get from investment uh, uh, you know, consultants and clients, what would they be trying to quantify? Yeah, this happens quite a lot. We often get quite a few questions from consultants saying, how much does ESG contribute? Does it make a difference? In terms of alpha. Al alpha, is it positive, is it, is it good? We know it's good. In examples like African Bank and Steinhoff, it's easy to say, we went maximum underweight Steinhoff, or we held zero positions, one of the two at any time. We got great benefits from it. That's fairly easy. African Bank, again, avoided the equity, it's easy. But in many cases, ESG issues are very subtle. It can be governance concerns, and we'll pick up this later on the portfolio construction, that just makes a portfolio tilt a bit in a different direction, away from one stock. So quantifying it is really difficult. An example would be um, cash flows. It's like asking us, how much alpha do you get from analyzing cash flows in a company? It's very similar to that. ESG is not a separate process. It's part of a larger matrix. I also want to be clear at this point that we don't look at every single ESG aspect. I don't want viewers to be under the impression that asset managers sit with a massive tick box and go through all the... We look at the, the material and pertinent issues on the integration side. On the engagement side, you've got more flexibility. There you can engage clients on things like recycling and green energy. And we still do that on the engage on the integration side, um, but it's a bit more focused. Okay, okay, guys. So it's not a black box. Uh, it's typically subjective. Uh, I want us to just look at the investment process. And at this point, we'll just uh, pull up a, a slide. Um, so if you look at how the process starts off, 
uh, we we filtered the universe, screening for you know value screens, um, and I know that uh, well before we, we, we go to you and um, um, we've discussed the theme Adel about you know the the investment process uh, or your ESG having to be part of your investment process DNA. What are the dangers? And we talked about uh, not. Uh, a bolt-on approach not working. What are the dangers of having that bolt-on approach? Uh, so in other words, what are the dangers of, ha of having an ESG department sitting outside of the investment team? Could you talk to us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say two things, Uki. Okay. So, you know, the first one is, is one of credibility. Um, something this audience might be familiar with, if you walk down the road to your local coffee shop, um, you would expect that, you know, the coffee beans are locally and ethically sourced. Well, not locally, but ethically sourced. And you'd assume that uh, the water that goes into the process is, um, is safe for consumption. If they had a um, compliance officer, let's say, at the, uh, at the checkout counter, um, who, who stood there with a, a stamp to, 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 to stamp your takeaway cup. I mean, it just, you know, takes away from, from the credibility that um, that barista actually went through the effort of, of doing what was the cre credible thing to do. Um, and that, that's why we believe, you know, bolt-on processes, um, whilst they, 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 may, they might uh, hold a place for, um, for, for some, uh, we feel it's better to have the, the process integrated. Um, secondly, uh, it's the, the, the second consideration is an altogether human one, and that's the, 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 the concept of sunk costs. So if somebody has gone through the process of doing a bunch of work um, uh, and you know, doing all the fundamental, uh, fundamental analysis uh, to come at the tail end of that process uh, at the point of decision making and say, hey, listen, I think you missed X, Y, Z. Um, and all the work you've done is worth naught. Uh, that, you know, that just doesn't fly. People will resist that tooth and nail um, and the conclusion will have been reached. Uh, and that's why it's probably, you know, um, of, of uh, utmost importance to have this, this process uh, integrated from the very beginning. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And the next question is uh, to you. So if you look at a, a, a typical investment process, as I, as I alluded to earlier, the first step is, is screening for, you know, to filter the universe down, you know, using value assessment. Should we also be screening at this stage for, you know, ESG factors? I know that this is something that you're very passionate about. Um, can you talk to us about, should we be doing it? If not, why not? Yes, this is an interesting topic. We do it for some clients. So where clients have large mandates, and it's a very good thing. They're able to give us what is their subjective and to some extent moral overlay on the stocks. They could eliminate things like coal, they could eliminate things like um, oil. If they have concerns around tobacco, they could remove those. So here we're talking about negative screening. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. But negative screening itself isn't ESG. Um, I think there are also a couple of dangers in that we can't do this on our general retail clients because everyone's at a different stage of the journey. Some clients may want coal out completely. Others may say, invest in coal, but drive change. Others may say, invest in coal, but drive regulatory change. Others may say, invest in coal, but there's a just transition coming. So it'll sort itself out. So everyone's at slightly different stages, so it makes it quite tricky. We have another quirk in South Africa, in our equity market, in that it's small. So if you start excluding coal miners and um, oil producers and anyone who, invests, who mines coal. Oh. Your, your universe narrows That's quite, narrow. yeah. You have another trick as well, in that there's a danger in once you screen believing you've implemented ESG. Let me give you an example. Let's say you screen coal and oil, now you think you've got a fairly carbon clean portfolio. Now it turns out you invest in banks and those banks are backing oil pipelines through Africa. So now you've still got the exposure. So it's a very good thing, but it needs to be done with understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the impact is. So if clients have got large enough portfolios, we're happy to do it. On the retail products, we can't. So our alternative is then to drive change. And that comes on the engagement side, which we must have a webinar on sometime. Please. Yes, 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 <laughs> sure. Um, okay, Adil, um, so th this then brings us to step two of uh, our investment process. So we've filtered out the universe. 
now the analyst does the work. Um, you know, the way I understand ESG, it's, it's, it's similarly to the fundamental analysis. It's about identifying risks and opportunities. And I think we've, we've, we've talked about risks. I'd like to shift gears and talk about what are the opportunities of having ESG as part of uh, your, your DNA and, and the analysts living uh, uh, ESG. And, and could you maybe give us a, a, an example of, of the opportunities we've seen recently? By applying those ESG uh, considerations. Yeah, sure, Zuki. Um, so yeah, let's let's look at a, Impala as a recent example, uh, and this really speaks to the second step of the investment process, uh, which is arguably you know the heart of um, of, of the decision making process from an investment perspective. Um, what did we know walking into kind of the, the, the pandemic or the COVID incidents with, uh, with, with Impala? Um, so we knew there were some structural factors uh, occurring within, within the space, uh, namely around demand and supply. Um, the, 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 there's the kind of long term uh, you know, threat of fewer internal combustion engines requiring um, platinum or PGM-based uh, catalytic converters. Uh, obviously, um, producers meet that with a, with a supply-side response. So that was, that was something we had known. Um, those factors were obviously exacerbated by, by COVID, but what, what the, the virus and, and COVID in particular had done was introduced completely new idiosyncratic and very nuanced risk factors. Um, namely, uh, the threat to mining sustainability and what should happen um, if the virus got into, in, into the mining complex. Um, and this raises some very interesting questions. So questions around, you know, what, what do we do if, if people become ill? Um, how many people become ill? For how long? Uh, questions to which we had no answers and uh, precedents, the last precedent for something like this probably occurred about 100 years ago um, during the, the, the Spanish flu. Um, at, at this point, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite important that the analyst kind of goes out and, and does the field work as part of the fundamental research process. Uh, and I'll let Ant talk to, to that for, um, for, for a second, the, the, the work that uh, was undertaken uh, by our analyst Aisha and 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 in kind of ascertaining what the what what the risk exposures were for um, the likes of Impala. Thanks. We have Aisha Samsudin. She's our mining analyst. Um, I mainly tagged along for this, um, but there were engagements we had with the company that gave us quite a lot of comfort. So the market is seeing this enormous risk and this enormous concern around COVID. We had the same concerns. But there's knowledge about how Impala works. We know their labor relations. We know their labor relations are very strong. We know they can work in shifts. They were able to um, pick staff on comorbidities. We're talking a company that's got a good clinic and hospital on site. So it's a new idiosyncratic risk. But at the same time, they've got processes which can adapt to it. Keep in mind, miners have been dealing with HIV and AIDS for some time and trying to handle that as well. So enormous amount of comfort. There were also other fundamental factors. So platinum had come off a good run, good strong balance sheets. Um, and for example, they were able to bring maintenance forward. But the real, one of the real key issue, issues was that Aisha had this relationship with the company and was able to, able to say, um, this is a problem, it's a worry, but not as much as the market thinks. And we think these guys are going to cope with it fairly well. And they did. And we went overweight, and it's been quite a strong contributor to performance. It's a good example of where ESG presents an opportunity. Yeah. Markets misread it. Um, analyst dives in and gets a better view. It also reinforces the, the, the point we've been making throughout uh, the session that it, it absolutely has to sit within the analyst. Yeah. Good. Uh, Adil, so, so now we've, we've, we've done the filtering. Uh, the analyst has done the work. Uh, just take us through what the next step uh, in that feedback session will be. Sure. So um, at this point, you know, the analyst probably has a, a bunch of information um, and that uh, will be presented to a larger forum, uh, what is arguably our, our research forum, uh, investment uh, research forum. Uh, 
and uh, the the issues at hand will be debated um, sometimes quite hotly. Uh, you know, other times there's fairly broad agreement when 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 issues are uh, are, are easy to reach a conclusion about. Um, at that point, uh, a decision is either reached, um, or if there are any loose ends, uh, we ask the analysts to go back into the field uh, and kind of tie up those loose ends. Um, but to the extent that a decision is reached, we would typically look to implement in portfolios. Um, in the case of Impala, we increased our exposure, and that worked um, pretty well at, at that particular point in time. And to see you interested in jump in here, please go ahead. Mm, thanks. Um... I think this is where it's very important that we emphasize that this becomes a team matter and that the team debates this very thoroughly because someone might have seen this before. Old hands, senior portfolio managers can come in and say, I've seen this before in X stock or I've seen something similar. Or you simply get that diversity of views that you need um, to give enough input to come to an answer. It's an area where we saw some of our peer managers, and some are really good managers, really good value managers. But if you've got a very strong portfolio manager who's got a very singular view and a small team or operates quite on his own, we saw that's where things like Steinhoff and African Bank get missed. Okay. Um, because you, you didn't have that depth of experience and you didn't have those voices coming out. Um, in our case, we had Craig Butters saying there's a big concern, but it can also be a case of an analyst saying something and other manager picking up on that and saying, you know, I see you worried there. Let's talk more about that. And that's where you can wrap up loose ends as well. Um, you can pull in a thread and say, you've touched on this. Can you go and do some more work on that? Chat to Ant. Let's go and do some engagement there and see what we can find out. So you're saying a team-based approach uh, is one of our competitive edges. It's a competitive edge, and I, th I really think it's key for ESG because it's got to live with the analyst, and they've got to be experts in ESG themselves. Um, absolutely. Adil, so... The next uh, point in our investment uh, process is portfolio construction. Talk to us about portfolio construction in relation to ESG integration. Sure. Um, so it gets a bit nuanced here, Zuki. Uh, and at this point, we we try to give um, portfolio managers the um, their degrees of freedom. Uh, you know, as a generalization, uh, I'd come back to Aesop's fable: um, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. Um, is uh, is is it you know is is to the the the, the right number of birds um, which bush uh, those those sort of questions need to be debated. So uh, another way of saying it is you know if I am going to take on X risk, um, what uh, what do I expect in return from a compensation perspective? Um, a uh, typical example would be, you know, we, we're looking to uh, increase our exposure to the mining sector. Um, and if there are two companies that offer similar uh, return prospects, we would ideally choose um, the stock with fewer risk factors, and that would be fewer ESG risk factors um, and and vice versa. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I'll, 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 I'll leave it there. Zippy. And made the point earlier that you don't look at every single ESG factor and that you focused on material ESG factors. Um, so I think then the final stage in the investment process is uh, risk monitoring and control. And I know that you play some sort of role here. Uh, do you want to talk to us about what role you play and give us an example of, of uh, you know, where you contributed? Yeah, my role comes kind of right at the end. I think it's important to note that um, the risk still sits with the analyst. Um, and ultimately they're responsible for the risk on their stock. So they have to do ongoing monitoring of the particular risks and the portfolio managers are still doing risk controls on their side. How does their portfolio look? What's their overall exposure? And that's an ongoing process. Right. In addition, we also have an investment oversight committee which tries to bring an independent view as well to look at uh, total fund and total company exposure so we can pick up any common threads or red flags that we see on, on, a, on a much more broad basis. You run the danger of slightly getting back into that black box area right. where you're trying to measure risks and make subjective calls, but do you have the benefit of an outside team? And there we may even use outside providers um, to balance information often. As and a health check. As a health check, absolutely, absolutely. Um, in terms of examples, yeah, two quick examples. Um, we had a stock last year, I won't mention the name, 
they had some issues there around um, one non-executive director passed away. We had the CEO resign. He had conflict with other directors there. CFO also resigned temporarily in sympathy. Um, there was a board investigation into proprietary, in proprietary actions. Um, the culture was just unhappy and the strategy wasn't clear. And that would be an area that flagged up, for example. So at that point, we then started moving the engagement sphere, talked to the company. Uh, we appointed two directors to the board. Uh, company's doing much healthier now. It's ongoing engagement. A couple of concerns we're ironing out. Um, but overall, we've got great relationship. The CEO is back. Um, that's a good example of how that risk monitoring process plays out. But I want to make the point that you don't always get a happy ending. Um, let's take Sassel as an example. It's between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they're restructuring at the moment. They're in some financial quandary um, as to how they're going to go forward. They need to go to green energy, but the capital isn't there. Uh, at the same time, your regulatory issues in terms of moving away from ESCOM becomes tricky. So they've really got themselves in a tricky position. And there it can be largely a game of just monitoring, getting continuous information, understanding what's going on, how that could work. For them, for example, 87% of their pollution comes from one plant secunda. 50% of that comes from power generation. 50% comes from feedstock into the process that makes your petroleum and wax products and oils. Uh, and they've got to change that. So if that changes, we see a radical shift. But until then, they can't get there. And they're in quite a difficult space. So that's an example where you haven't necessarily got a really happy ending. You're just kind of watching how it plays out. OK. I think this, uh, this uh, is a nice case for having a, an engagement webinar yes, please. sometime in the future. I think, guys, thanks for your time. Uh, before we go to uh, questions, uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, and I'll start with you, Ado. Sure, Zuki. So I'd say the the, the key takeaway um, from my perspective is um, ESG is really part of the risk spectrum of investment decision making, uh, albeit on, on on softer issues, uh, and it should be viewed as such. Um, and you know, just keep in mind Aesop's fable: a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. Um, and you got to decide what the gap between the bird in hand and and the two in the bush um, are worth. Thank you. And? I think a few key things. Some ESG factors can be mathematically deduced. Most can't. It's, it is quite subjective. And I think the key thing is that screening is great, but it's not pure ESG in terms of the investment process. And neither is a bolt-on process. It can work for other asset managers. We don't think it works for us. Um, so this aspect of DNA and ESG running through the investment team is really key. Um, we can talk more about how we engage with companies in a different webinar, but if people take that home, I'll be, I'll be really happy. Okay. Thank you, guys. I think uh, we will now open up for, for questions. And, and please, uh, we, 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 we're sticking with the theme of ESG in terms of integration on the equity side. Thank you very much. Okay. So thanks, thanks for that, Ant. Um, the first question coming from the audience, guys, um, and I'm going to keep this uh, open-ended, um, so please jump in, uh, whoever feels that they need to. Uh, the first question is, what is the process for de determining, because earlier we were talking about we only consider uh, what we term material ESG uh, factors. Um, how do we determine materiality? I don't know, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it, Suki. Um, so, um, uh, I'd start off by saying, you know, there is a, a great deal of, of judgment uh, that goes into assessing how material and ESG factor um, turns out to be. Um, but there are a few guidelines. Um, you know, we, we spoke a bit uh, to uh, the risk spectrum. Uh, so where things are readily quantifiable, uh, we can make a fairly accurate uh, assessment of what the financial impact of certain ESG factors uh, might be. Um, in the absence thereof, uh, you know, there's, there's an element of discretion and, uh, and commerciality uh, that uh, you, you would kind of build into your, um, your assessment and decision-making framework. Uh, but as a, as a general rule, I would say, um, ideally, you'd want to avoid earthquake risk. So if things, you know, if they went wrong, uh, they went horribly wrong. 
um, there's probably very little uh, you can do from a uh, risk management perspective to handicap that. Um, I remember kind of very recent example where um, one of my colleagues, uh, our head of equity said, you know, is, is there an appropriate discount uh, for a company uh, that has governance concerns? Uh, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to quantify. The 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 answer is probably you know closer to no. There 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 isn't an adequate discount. So I think it comes comes back to judgment. Can I just jump in here? Sure. I, I, I presume it's also fair to say it depends on the industry. So some industries some issues be more material than others. So for mining, you're looking at tailings dams. You're looking at water pollution. Uh, with banks, your focus more materially might end up being on governance aspects. Right. So, uh, Idle, that's, is that a fair comment to say you do tend to tell your risks and your analysis of those risks and understanding of those risks opportunities depending on the industry that you're looking at? I know. Absolutely. And yeah, so it's, you know, they're horses for courses. Uh, it's, it's nuanced. Um, if it was easily quantifiable, it would be a tick box exercise. Uh, and any old service provider could do it, um, but as we said, you know, it's it's not. So yes, it's it's certainly nuanced. I think a nice follow-up question is: uh, Can we think of examples where ESG-related factors have led to a generation of new ideas? I know we we touched on Impala um, early on. Can you think of uh, just generally any anything uh, any other ideas that have come about by you know taking ESG factors into consideration? Yeah, so ESG is probably not synonymous uh, with the term opportunity. Um, you know, it's often, and I've made reference to it uh, in kind of the upfront uh, discussion we had um, around uh, ESG being uh, a, co a component of the risk spectrum. Um, but, you know, I remember uh, talking to Ant um, kind of right up front as we were preparing for this webinar, uh, and he used the term um, two sides of the same coin, uh, where risk is the one side and opportunity is the other side. Uh, yeah, me memory doesn't really, um, nothing springs to, to mind in terms of recent uh, examples of where ESG uh, might have been an opportunity. Uh, but the avoidance of loss, uh, I would say, is also an opportunity. Uh, and if, it's, if e ESG factors have steered us in a particular direction, um, that could be seen as, as opportunity for something we might not otherwise have, have looked at. Uh, I know uh, Ant has uh, some examples around uh, the, the property sector that might be more applicable to, to the question. Yes, um, I think a good point to make is we're not seeing massive shifts. So you are seeing new industries coming out of the ESG. You are seeing uh, wind farms and um, clean energy. Those unfortunately aren't always listed, so that isn't always our space. But I think it's easy to, to mistake the fact that we're also seeing opportunities come up on a more subtle level. Um, Idol mentioned property, that's a good example. So as they move to clean energy, they're finding all kinds of benefits in terms of cost saving, uh, stability of power supply in, in blackouts. Um, so ESG isn't always the massive structural shift that people seem to perceive, perceive it to be. It can be in some instances, but in some cases it's existing industries where people are changing their behavior and those opportunities are coming out. And I think that's, that's a really interesting space, particularly those who've got the first mover advantage and start adapting quickly. That's a very interesting point. Thank you for that. Uh, then staying with you, Anthony, um, the next question from the audience is, um, where do we uh, source our ESG information? Is it from company meetings? Is it in-house? Uh, do we rely on, on, on you know, broker reports? Do we rely on you know, ESG data providers? All of those. Um, I think a strong provider, and the, the biggest component is gonna be your in-house research. That's your analyst doing a tremendous amount of homework on public documents and understanding the financials your company is going to provide you with some information. Some companies are more transparent than others, but some are really good. And then we talk to them and we engage them. And it's a good litmus test for ideas. You get, mm -hmm. a, you get a, a perception idea. You go to the company and say, we're thinking you're doing this. We're thinking this works and doesn't work. Can you talk to us about that? And that may influence factors. We do have some ESG providers on, on particular stocks, which are fantastic. 
Uh, we've got the high parasec, really good, Farsight, awesome, Intergram are great, uh, and new. There are quite a few out there that are really good. They can provide a health check on some of our thinking. So they will, for example, provide certain risk ratings, and that's a good health check to see if we're roughly on the same page. And we will phone them, and we will debate it with them, and um, argue in a nice way, and find out where we are and where they're positioned. Um, and that's quite interesting. Data providers we are looking at, we are finding some of the data from the very large providers can be a bit dated. It's an area we're exploring, but fundamentally, if you have to give a number, 90% is gonna be the analyst doing their own homework and then talking to the company later, They're talking to investor relations, uh, testing out their ideas, what our thoughts are, where they're going. And also through engagement, which is a different, a different topic, mm -hmm. and we'll come to that later, but that's when you would engage uh, and say in a mining area, your safety record's improved. Can you maintain that? Can you sustain that? Because we know that if you don't, then your regulatory licenses might sure. come under threat. Sure, okay. Just, just I know that the webinar is focused on uh, integration, specifically integration within, uh, into the investment process, but we have been getting a lot of questions around engagement. Uh, would, be, would it be fair to say that engagement is a, a collaborative effort? Uh, and also, you know, um, when can we talk about engagement? Is, is this maybe a topic for another uh, yes, webinar? Yes, I think we'd love one. I don't think we'd have one immediately because I think the marketing team's got quite a lot lean, uh, lined up, but it's definitely something worth discussing. Engagement is symbiotic with integration and they feed off each other. You will engage, get information, and then integrate that. Or you will do integration, come up with questions and post it back to the company. So for simplistic purposes, we focus today on integration, right. but really they do sit hand in hand um, and they play very heavily off each other. Engagement gives you more freedom to engage in stuff that may not impact the investment, but where you may want to drive change. Yeah. And that's the example we've been chatting to some of the property stocks about green energy. Um, it has made a slight difference to income. Um, is it overly material? Possibly not. Is it the right thing to do? Yes. Are they responding well? Absolutely. Um, so those two, that's how those two kind of sit hand in hand. Thank you for that. And then again, so, uh, sorry, uh, Adil, I was still staying with Anne. Uh, and maybe, and also please feel free to jump in at any time here. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions around, uh, from the audience around uh, whether or not Prudential will consider launching an ESG fund. I know that uh, we, we touched on, you know, the, the structure of our market versus perhaps international markets. Um, so I'll open this up to, to, to any of you guys. Are we at any point considering uh, launching an ESG fund? I think we're always open to new opportunities. As we've highlighted, there is the danger that our universe can become quite short depending how you define that. We're also a house that doesn't believe in product proliferation. We don't produce enormous amount of products to be all things to all men. So we're quite conservative in producing new products. We will test them first quite carefully and make sure they operate and we're comfortable with them. It's something that's always slightly on the, not slightly, it is always on the radar, but there are challenges for this. We do see other ESG funds coming in. They may operate in a slightly different space to us. Um, we're very focused on, on listed products and that can be quite tricky. We also um, don't want to launch a fund that's overly simplistic on ESG. An example is you could have a fund that says it's infrastructure based and you put PPC in there but we know from a carbon production point of view, cement production is sure. horrendous. So it's a complex area. It's one we do look at. We don't currently have a product that we're bringing out. Um, it's something we analyze all the time. A better thing to do though is to do ESG properly within your investment process as it is. So our ESG is integrated into our investment process that touches every single one of our funds. And that's where you want to be. You want to be the stewards of the funds that you manage not necessarily screening out stuff you don't want. Um, you get a better opportunity to drive change. That being said, there are certain red, red limits we won't invest in. Um, I'm not gonna discuss those now, um, but there are certain lines we will draw, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's better to be a responsible steward in the assets you've got for us at this point in time. Adil, uh, wearing your uh, head of research uh, you know, hat, Talk to us about ESG funds in relation to the structure uh, of the JSE, especially then if you, if you, uh, you know, apply further screens in terms of liquidity and so on. Sure. Um, 
I probably wouldn't be able to add anything more uh, to Anne's very comprehensive um, enunciation of uh, our views on 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 product and uh, um, and a dedicated ESG fund uh, at at this stage, Zuki. So you know, I'll probably you know plead a Charlie Munger and say nothing more to add on that. <laughs> uh, but you know, more um, uh, more more practically, just around the the, the JSE. Um, we, we, we are already dealing with a fairly narrow universe uh, of investment opportunities, uh, especially from a liquidity perspective, as you alluded to. Um, uh, if, if, you, if you were honest about the extent of uh, the investable universe, um, you know, the number of names that you could actually deploy meaning amounts of capital toward, uh, you you're probably in the in 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 the 60 to 70 uh, stock range. Um, adding uh, further uh, filter on onto those names would obviously you know um, would, would would reduce that that number quite uh, quite considerably, uh, which narrows the investment opportunity set. Um, so you know, it's there is a there is a practical consideration uh, to what sort of investment objectives you you can achieve uh, by being too prescriptive around ESG filters. Just to add to that, I mean, I also want to make the point that we do do screening for certain clients for large clients where we can do it on, on request. But again, everyone's at a different stage of the journey. Um, on request, we can do, uh, and we do do, and that's great. But then you need to shift your benchmark. Um, you can't maintain the JSC as a benchmark to measure performance right. against and then exclude large numbers of stocks. So it has to be like an ESG related in, in this? Yes, and, and clients can talk to us about that if they want to. We do have clients that have done that and that's fantastic, um, but they do need to talk to us about that uh, up front. Um, um, and then again, this is another open-ended question from um, Isaac. And I think we've touched on this in different guises uh, when we talked about, you know, uh, are ESG factors quantifiable? Uh, Isaac's question is, are investments in ESG profitable, taking into consideration the size of the SA economy? Yes, we've seen examples where we've definitely benefited strongly from ESG. I mean, the standoff comes to mind. Sorry, it's the horse we drag out, but it, is, it stands out. Um, we also see it sort with African Bank, but we've seen it more subtly as well. Um, when companies fail spectacularly, and typically on the governance side, we don't always see it like a standoff. It doesn't always make headlines. Often it's an entity that's stumbling along, stumbling along in spite of itself. And what you'll see is that entity will slowly collapse and then unbundle to different units. Those units might get listed. The rest will fade away into buyouts. Um, understanding that process and avoiding those companies or coming in at, at, the, at the listing stage of the unbundling is a good place to be. So yes, it, it does bring benefits and it's not always exclusion. It can be opportunity, but typically it is exclusion. All right. Um, but definitely yes. Anything to add, Adam? I'll leave it there, Zuki. Okay. I think this is also, this is a, um, we'll conclude with this question. And I think it's also a, a very pertinent question from Dirk. Um, how do we apply these? I know the focus today was around equity. What Dirk wants to know is how do we apply the principles we've discussed, the, you know, like how do we yeah. integrate ESG factors when we think about debt? And I guess, uh, you know, here we're talking probably around SOE debt. Uh, that's a great question. It's a very similar process. So the analysts going through the, the, the same stages. Um, the universe is a lot smaller. So often you're balancing diversification and risks and opportunities, but it follows pretty much the same process. Um, to some extent, your ability to get information can be a little bit more limited, particularly from SOE. So then you have to engage quite heavily. Okay. Um, see if I can think of an example. So, so, so uh, around SOEs, what are the, you know, so like there's E, there's S, and there's G. I would imagine uh, most of the issues are around governance. Most are, but not always. So, okay. for example, we've had uh, great engagements with Rand Water, for example. They're sinking boreholes, supporting communities, uh, monitoring leakage to those communities um, in terms of getting the government mandate out of, of of, of uh, providing services. And keep in mind, they don't have to be super profitable, they just need to be stable and financially viable right. to make the coupons. So there you can have those conversations, but you're quite right, a lot function around governance. Mm. Um, but it really is the same process. You look at your universe, um, you understand the risks, you engage the company, the analyst comes to a view, 
they'll bring it to the credit meeting, they will discuss it further, they may come back for further engagements, uh, we may discuss those with the SOEs. After that, the team will decide whether that should go in or out of portfolios, how it should function, you go to your construction, and then ongoing monitoring. So as, as things come up, and with SOEs, unfortunately, they do come up frequently, um, in the news and these items are, are reported or people contact us, we then re-engage um, around governance issues, particularly with board changes around SOEs, that type of stuff. There's a lot of angst around debt, right? So I think, talk to us about, you know, implicit and explicit guarantees and the role that yield plays in, in, in terms of getting us comfortable. Oh, crumbs. <laughs> um, yes. Um, good example is, if you need to tie this in with ESG, um, would be perhaps Land Bank. So Land Bank had issues recently. Um, and the question there was, would you get contagion to other, sure. other debt issuers? Would there be the same concerns? How would yields move? And that was quite interesting because the market didn't respond as radically as they could have. There was an understanding in the market that the land bank issue was a governance issue that fell around the maturity of their debt profile. It was quite unique to them. So other issuers came to market and still managed to get good subscriptions. So it, it's focusing on that space um, and understanding how those yields could move. But you're quite spot on. Where you have governance concerns and you have concerns around whether the guarantee can be met, and whether it's explicit or inexplicit, particularly now, given the government's current fiscal mm -hmm. fund situation, um, that is the area that you monitor. How will yields react? And it will often be to governance issues. So where you've got boards continually changing, or you have scandals coming through, you need to watch how that, how that moves, and then we need to engage those boards quickly and find out what's happening. And that's not always easy, because you are dealing with some parastatals. Some are really good. Um, some, to be frank, are, are not so good. Um, and that then needs to be accounted for as well in your portfolio construction. Do we know what's going on? Do we know what's happening? And their diversification also becomes a key mm, issue. Mm. Um, you can't always think, well, there's a government guarantee. I can load up on the stock. Um, the guarantee might be there. That's great. But in the short term, you might see yield fluctuations. Not quite my wheelhouse, though. Um, so I think that's a question better posed to, to Gareth Byrne, our, our head of fixed income. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for your time, Adil. Uh, thank you for your time, Anthony. And uh, once again, thank you very much to uh, the audience for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we, we hope we've, we've answered all your questions to the best of our abilities. Uh, those questions that we're, we're not able to get to, uh, our team of experts will, will, will get to those. Uh, but yeah, thank you and uh, have a good day further. Can chip in one more thing? If you have further questions, please chat to your sales consultants or your client services team. Uh, we're always happy to engage on these things. We're always happy to have these conversations. So if you have burning questions, ESG is an important area. It's an important part of our process and you should be asking these questions. So, so please feel free to, to engage us on them. Uh, don't be shy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks everyone. Thanks.